Here's what we will be working towards. It's a fairly simple PDF. The actual size of this document, if printed, would be 22 by 34 inches. It's got a fairly reasonable base map. That's uh, not the best quality for resolution, but it's good enough. A little bit better than what you would get for screen resolution. And it includes uh, some very basic information as well as some space where we could include additional information in terms of overlay keys um, and uh, anything else that may add to this map as we work with it some more. So what I'll be working on today is just getting this created in Illustrator and going about it uh, using a few different tools. So first tool we'll probably want to start with is Illustrator and I'll go ahead and open mine up. Now, if you have a CS5 or 5.5, it will look just like mine. There's no change between those two versions. If you have something earlier, it may not look the same. Also, I've got a couple plugins installed and extensions, so you might not see tools like this little bunch down here. But I'll talk in a moment about getting your screen to look like mine. First, though, let's start with a new file by going to File and New. And you should see this dialog here. I've already typed in my height and width. Uh, if you hit this drop down list, you've got a few kind of common sizes, but um, I'm going to go ahead and retype 22 by 34 inches and I'll hit tab. So uh, the color mode, this is probably, uh, you know, probably something that would be printed at some time. So I'll use CMYK as my setting and the other settings I will leave the same. And I'll go ahead and hit OK. So I need to resize this so it will fit into the window that you see. So right away, um, your document shows up. If you double click with the right button over the hand tool, it's a little trick to rezoom just on your artboard. So if I double click with the right button, it zooms that into place. So go ahead and do that if, uh, if you kind of uh, changed your window size like I did. So uh, let's talk briefly about setup. If you click on window, and go to workspace. There's some pre-packaged setups in terms of how your tools look. If you go to automation, it gears your screen for automation. I have mine set to essentials. It's really a bare bones uh, tool setup. And really all you have is this bar across the top, this vertical bar here that includes a bunch of little pop-outs that we'll be jumping to. And let me move that as well as my main toolbar. Now I'm going to hit this little arrow right here to make that a little bit more fatter so you can see it. Here's our document. All right, so a couple other things we need to change if you'd like to follow along. Uh, I'm going to go to my Illustrator and Preferences. I'll just click on the first one. Once this is open, you can access all of the other preferences, but I want my grid. Let's go to Guides and Grid. And I'll set this to a grid line every one inch and subdivisions. You know, what? I'll change that to two and I'll hit tab and I'll hit OK. So we don't see anything until we turn our grid on. The grid is not something that prints. It is uh, it's just there to help you align things. And you can see it if you click on view and go down to show grid. So there we go. I can see my artboard. I can see my canvas area, which is the area outside of the artboard. And I can see my grid. So under view, you can turn that on and off just by doing that. You can also snap to and from the grid uh, by going to the view settings. So we'll come back to that in a moment. But one thing, uh, and I intentionally did this, I want this to be wide. I want this to be in landscape mode, not in portrait mode. So what you'll want to do to change it, I mean, we could either go back to our document setup, start a new file, but uh, I'm going to click this tab right here, this button that says document setup. Click on that and we'll see this. Click on edit artboards and here's where you can change the size. You can add uh, artboards, you can remove them. But what I'm interested in is this little button right here, landscape. So that just switches everything. So now it is wider than it is taller. To get out of this, you can either hit escape or click on your selection tool and just click into space. So once again, I will double click with my right button that zooms that back into place. All right, so there's a few other things uh, that in terms of navigating, I'll let you do on your own. We'll go over in class as well. On the class Blackboard, I've got a section called Class Notes, and one of the links here is Getting Started with Illustrator. Recommend that you go to that, dig through a couple of the introduction um, tutorials if you are new to Illustrator, 
paying attention to how you navigate and get around. So I'll be jumping around rather quickly. You might want to review that before continuing. But I'm going to kind of get this set up uh, very simply to look like my base plan. So I'll be talking about some structural things. There's that again. Uh, both within this document and how I'm saving this. So a good idea is to actually save this. And uh, I'm going to just save this on my desktop, and I'm going to make a new folder. Let's call this uh, LA232A1 for assignment one. And we'll call this base map. I like to add WIP, as in work in progress, just so when I'm scanning through my file types, I'll know and I'll rename that when and if this gets complete. And uh, you've got some options here. The default settings are usually pretty good. All right, so that is saved. We should see that update in a moment. There we go. All right. The second thing is to start thinking about your layers. You can always move things into the correct layers after the fact, but it's a good habit to get the structure set up before you work on anything. So you can either click on your little layers icon right here, if you can see that toolbar. These you can tear off. So if I click and drag, I can tear that off. If that goes away, if you just absolutely cannot find it, you can also access it from Windows and Layers. There we go. So there's a few things in this very simple base map. You've got a background image. So I'll just go ahead and change that one, that layer name to image. I'll make a new one by clicking this little icon down here, or I bet you can do it from up here too. Yep, that little flyout box, new layer and I'll call this text. So for the most part, those are only the really two important layers I need. Uh, you know, I might want to make one called guides. Now, whichever one of these is highlighted, that is the layer you will draw in when you're using Illustrator. And uh, I'll go ahead and just keep that on guides for now. And I'm going to do two things here. I'm going to turn on my uh, grid and I'm going to snap to the grid. So you have to go back to here and uh, snap to grid. So now anything I draw will snap either to the main lines or the subdivisions. And I'll go ahead and click on this little tool here. Now if you click and hold down your left button, you usually, usually get some more options on a lot of these tools. If you go over to this little bar here and I let go, it gives me a little tear off. So now I can access all of those tools right here. And I just want to draw a rectangle. I want to kind of start thinking about what my base map is going to look like. And as in that example, you know, I want most of the map, the scaled map to be on the left hand side and this right hand area to be open. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of click and drag and I'm dragging as soon as I let go, you know, you don't have to be close. I'll just like leave it there. Uh, you can come back, click on the selection tool, the black one, and I can kind of nudge this back into play. So if I want that to be a half inch from the border all the way around, you know, I'll just kind of eye it. Uh, so it looks about like that. It's about square. It looks pretty good. Now I'm going to undo that. A couple times. There it goes away. Whatever your foreground, whatever your, uh, it's actually the, the, the stroke style and the uh, fill color, whatever those are set to, that's what you will be drawing. So if I change this ahead of time, double click on the fill color. I'll make that red. There that is. Now anything I draw will be red. You can also change it after the fact. So I'm just going to drag a few little rectangles. If I click on this one with my select tool, double click on that fill color and I'll change it to blue. There we go. Now anything I subsequently draw inherits that. So a little tangent moment here, kind of a nice little tool that you can use is the eyedropper and it's the letter I on your keyboard is the shortcut. So if I tap I on my keyboard, I can click something else and whatever shape I had selected will inherit those settings. So really quick, I'm going to change this one here. I'll change the uh, the fill color to kind of this pinkish, muddy, reddy, gray, and I'm going to double click on my edge color and give it something like you know orange. And up here, I can make that much bigger. That stroke color. So let's go 60. So there we go. So now that shape is inheriting that. If I grab with my selection tool. I'll just kind of draw a box around these guys, hit my eye on my keyboard, tap on that shape. They all inherit those settings. So let's back up, getting a little bit far away from what I'd like to show you. And if you ever want to reset your fill and your stroke color, 
It's a really tiny icon right below it, right there. Click on that, and now everything's back to normal. All right, let's do this again. Dragging and letting go. So there's my shape. Uh, that's roughly where I want my image to go. Just making a placeholder for now. Here's kind of a neat little trick too. If you right click on that, you can select make guides. Well, usually you can, let's try it again. Select, right click, there we go, make guide. So that just converts that shape into a guide that I can snap to. And because I'm still in my guides layer, that's where it was created. And notice I can turn that on and off. So I'll just leave that like it is for now. Let's move that out of the way. All right, so the other item we had here, some text. Now this text includes some very simple information, the name of this place, the city, the longitude and latitude, as well as a written and graphic scale, all very, very important elements. Also, uh, really important is there's a little bit of attribution. I'll talk about that a little bit later in this video, but notice I've got that Google Earth. I'll explain why I did that. So text tool, I'm going to click on that and talk very briefly about the text tool. If you click once, if I just click and release, it creates what's called a single line text. Now it's very small, so I'm going to triple click. That selects everything, and up here I will change that to a size 72. There we go. Now, back to the text tool. If you click and drag, notice what's happening. You're creating what's called a text block. So if I let go, So you can see what happens when you hit the edge of your text block. The interesting difference between these two, if you grab your select tool and click on any one, you've got these handles where you can, you can essentially resize that element. If you click in the center of it, you move it. That functions the same for both. If you grab one of these outside handles, depending on your text type, it treats it differently. So that's just a single line where I just clicked. If I click and drag, it rescales it. If I click and drag this one, it changes the boundary of that box. So very important distinction. Also, you're going to use a lot of modifier keys with every application that we will be using. If you hold on the shift key, so I'm holding shift before I start to scale, it maintains that aspect ratio. That's kind of cool. If you're moving something, so I'm starting my move, holding the mouse button down. If you press and hold shift, it locks it either in the horizontal, the vertical, or 45 degree movement. So you'll be using those a lot. Uh, another kind of neat thing here is if you start your move and you hold down either Option on the Mac or Alt on Windows, it creates a copy. So this is kind of cool. I'm holding down Option. If I let go of my mouse button, it created a copy. Now, if I do a Command D or a Control D on Windows, Command D is on the Mac, it does a duplicate in that same direction. So that's kind of a neat little trick there. So here's what I'll do. First of all, I was drawing these in the wrong, oops, I was drawing these in the wrong uh, layer. Here's how you fix it. If you do what I did, you can select everything, copy it, or cut it. Probably cut it in this case. Go to the layer that you want that to go into and paste in place. Uh, pay, where is it at? I'll do paste in front, which is essentially the same as a paste in place. So now that is under that text. There's a few ways to do it. That's one of the easier ways, but I'm going to delete it. Make sure I've got my text highlighted and I will do a single line text. So I'll click once and I'll type a uh, location. Notice it's keeping the same size um, as I, I previously set up here. So with my select tool, I'm going to hold down option, drag that down just a little bit. I've got my snap turned on, so still snapping. Okay, now I'm let go of the keyboard on my mouse. Now I will do that Command D or Control D a couple times, and it makes a nice even uh, duplicate from where that was. I'll go ahead and zoom in on that with the zoom tool. Now, these ones with my select tool, I'll make those a little bit smaller. I can either change the actual point size up here, or you can just scale it, and it does that dynamically. So location, this is actually the uh, site name. This one is called the uh, city name. No, and there's, this is, you don't have to do this for every single map. This is all just kind of an example that I'm using. I like to include the longitude and latitude just because everything is uh, geo-based these days and it'd be nice to go back and find this site very easily. 
and scale is one inch equals something. One inch equals something feet. Let me talk very briefly about scale. For landscape architecture, you will most likely be using what's called an engineering scale, where it's usually one inch equals some real world measurement, as opposed to an architectural scale. Those are typically, if we're talking imperial, those are usually like one eighth of an inch equals a foot, one tenth of an inch equals a foot, one some factor of an inch equals a foot. And you know, an easy way to keep those two straight, you probably have a scale that looks like this. And there's two types. There usually is an engineering one, and there's usually an architectural one. The engineering one has the fraction on the end. The engineering has the number. So this example, that would be one inch equals 40 units on this. So if you ever want to know what scale to use, just grab one of these and use that or some multiple of it. It's usually going to be one inch equals 10 feet, one inch equals 20, one inch equals 200, something easy to remember like that. Do not do something really odd like one inch equals 270 feet. So we'll come back to that, but right now this is looking pretty good. Let's make that bold how about regular bold. And uh, we'll just kind of drag that down. All right, so I've got a pretty good setup well on our way to creating this. Now we'll leave this here. I will save it because it's, I want to save early, save often. There we go. So we need to find a nice base image to put in here. How do we do that? Well, you've got a few options. And uh, I need to find my browser that I had open. There we go. So some of the, the very low hanging fruit in this, social media, Google Maps, Bing Maps, there's a bunch of them out there. Good base map information. But this stuff is really built more for presentational. So if I do Fargo, North Dakota, click on up here to make sure I'm on a satellite view. Pretty good stuff. You know, I could just do a screenshot of this, slap that in there and call it good. Bing Maps, kind of the same. Each one of these, you know, big map making guys, uh, they lease all of their imagery. So sometimes it's the same, sometimes it's not. Bing Maps, you'll want to go to Bird's Eye and click on Aerial to get the Aerial equivalent. So some, sometimes one might have more recent imagery than another. But again, those are two really more just cloud-based, web-based presentational maps. Here's another really good one, earthexplorer.usgs.gov. So this one now, we're really getting more into a delivery service. There's a lot of open source aerial photography that you can use for non-commercial purposes. Now, what I mean by that is you can, you can use it in a process. If someone hires you to design something, you can use the base map in the design process. You just cannot resell and make money off of any of these maps. You always want to check. It's different depending on the source, but we'll, we'll chat more about that later. Let's zoom into Fargo. Now this one doesn't zoom. I've actually got to do it manually here. But the USGS one is really cool because you've got all these data sets, tons of data sets. We'll, we'll probably not really get into those this semester uh, but just know that it's a really good source for different types of maps and aerial and historical imagery. Now, kind of further down the spectrum is uh, a lot of GIS departments. And this is where you get the real hardcore raw data. So, for example, if I did a search for uh, aerial North Dakota you know, if you always kind of string together some kind of search like that, you'll usually get some pretty good stuff. So this very first one here will take me to a GIS site. And this has got some really very high resolution, large file size, pretty good imagery that you can get. Uh, all kinds of good stuff here. So again, that's that's really more on the, the content delivery end. These are more on the uh, presentational end. And there's a lot of ways to do this, but I'm going to show you really kind of a, a neat, quick way to get reasonable imagery from some of the free sources. It works good when you're a student, you know, in the professional world when you just need something quick. It's also pretty handy. So to do this, I'm going to use Google Earth. Here's Google Earth. And I'm going to open up both the Windows and the Mac version of Google Earth to show you a couple differences here. So if I zoom into Fargo, let's type that in the search box, hit zoom. 
it looks very much like the Google Maps. They both use the same geo web services. So there's the same structure underneath, just displayed in two different ways. I really like Google Earth. It's just a little bit easier to kind of snap around and uh, you know get your get your bearings down. You can end up looking into a three dimensions, and you can turn a whole bunch of layers on that have terrain. We do not want to do that. But here's what I wanted to go over. Just just so your settings are the same as mine. If you click on File on the Mac now, you want to go to actually, I'm sorry, Google Earth and Preferences. That will bring up this dialog. On Windows, yours is a little bit different. You want to go to Tools and Options. Now I'm using Google Earth Pro on my Windows side, so just ignore that. This should look the same. But once you've got this open, there's a few things we want to change here. On your 3D view, I like the Latin long to be decimal degrees. So let's set that. Oh, you'll see why in a moment. The rest of this can stay default. Cache, usually just crank that up. It's got a limit. I just come in here and type like 9999, hit tab, 9999, hit tab, hit OK. Uh, it'll probably, or apply, it'll probably tell you like, yeah, you can't exceed a certain number. There's the other one. Just max those out. So it looks like it's 1024 by 2000. Touring, eh, we'll leave that as the same. Navigation, really important. Drag your fly to speed somewhere in the middle of this bar. Otherwise, it, it gets kind of annoyingly slow as you're jumping around. Last one, really, really important for my kind of workflow. Make sure you have selected do not automatically tilt while zooming. If you don't have that checked, when you first install Google Earth, you zoom in and it automatically kind of angles you, and uh, I don't really like that. So once those are set, hit OK. Now, if you find yourself at a weird angle like this, and you got lots of stuff turned on, like 3D buildings and terrain. We want to turn those off. Where's my terrain? I don't see it. But anyway, um, yeah, because you'll click on buildings and that'll happen. So here's a couple things you want to do. Underneath your layers panel, it's that lower of the three panels on the left-hand side. Scroll to the top and click that box next to primary database, just so it's all off. I'll do the same thing here. On window side, looks a little bit different. You turn them all on or all off. You want them all off. The next thing, so you're looking straight down. That's really, really important for what we'll be doing here. Tap R on your keyboard. The R key will reorient your view to be straight up, looking down, and north will be up. So again, if you're kind of on a angle like that, it doesn't hurt, just hit R so we're looking straight down. Now if you zoom with your scroll, scroll wheel, if you click and drag, you can pan. That's really what we want. The other thing, we don't want a lot of overlay information here visually for what we'll be doing. So that includes my little Fargo, North Dakota. That's my search result. To get rid of that, hit this X right here underneath your top search panel. That will clear that out. You know, it might look different over here. Nope, it's the same. All right, let's go back to this. Um, next thing, click on View. And just make sure it looks like mine. Like, uh, turn off the um, turn off the status bar if you've got that. It's kind of useful information, but we want to turn that off. Make sure none of this other stuff is on. And under Show Navigation, that's this little guy up here. You can make that automatic, but uh, I'm going to set that to Never. You'll probably want to turn it back on eventually, but you'll see why I'm doing that. And um, you cannot turn off this Google Earth down in the corner. That is because any imagery you use from Google imagery services, you have to provide attribution. And one of the requirements is you have to keep that down there. So that is always there. OK, so I'm going to use a site over here. This is the Woodrow Wilson School. It's um, sitting on a block. It's kind of in between downtown Fargo and NDSU. And I'd like to create a map or use this uh, as my base map. And there's a few ways to do it. OK, you know, I've talked about those those services. There's actually some really, really high resolution Fargo images direct from the city you can get. But again, this is a really good workflow that you can use for a, a lot of different things. So we could just save this image. I can go up to Edit, oh, I'm sorry, File, Save, Save Image. The downside is it saves it at your screen resolution, which means uh, this resolution that you're looking at or that I'm recording this in is about a thousand pixels by 700 pixels. That's not scalable at all when we get to print media. So I'd blow it up and it would look really jaggedy. The pro version of Google Earth 
you can export higher resolution. So we go save, save image, um, but there's not higher resolution data. That's a very important difference. It means you can you can export this higher than screen resolution, but the imagery, if you zoom in on either Google Earth Pro or Google Earth Normal, you're not going to get any higher resolution imagery. You know, it, it kind of maxes out at a certain point. What I want to show you is kind of a neat little workaround for that. So that's what we'll do next. And it really has to do with taking screenshots of your screen. On the class Blackboard, I've got a list for today's notes. Back to these links. There's two here, taking screenshots with a Mac, taking screenshots with Windows. Based off of your computer, review those two because you'll want to know how to do them. On the Mac, it's kind of neat. It's um, it's Command Option 4, and that will give you a little window that you can draw. But here's, here's what we'll do. I'll zoom in a little bit more, and I'll do Command Option 4. My icon changes. And if I drag and release a window, it takes a snap of that and places it on my desktop. So I'll do that. I'll move over a little bit. Repeat the same thing. Now you want these to overlap. So what we're effectively doing here is we're kind of cheating the system. We're, we're getting a little bit higher resolution because we're zooming in. And we are going to stitch these together. So if I went all the way around, making sure to overlap, I would have a bunch of images that uh, have a common edge that could be conveniently stitched together to give us a little bit nicer map. Now, there's not a whole terrible lot of difference between here and here, but you get the idea if you were looking at a much larger area where this could be very handy. All right, so let's move Google Earth out of the way. Once you've done that, your images are going to save somewhere. On the Mac, it puts them on your desktop. Windows, just review that link and it will tell you where it put those. If I uh, look at a quick preview of these, I can see there's one, there's the other, but I know there's a common overlap. You want to overlap you know, a good 20% of all of these images. All right, so the next thing we're going to do, we're going to jump into Photoshop. Just like with Illustrator, the 5 and 5.5 versions of Photoshop are for all practical purposes identical. If you click on Window, you can go to Workspace and set it to Essentials if you'd like it to look like mine. Now, I've got a few things kind of floating off to the side here. You may or may not see those, that is all right. But what's important is that you see this toolbar and uh, these toolbars up at the top. So I'm going to open those screenshots. I've got them saved to my desktop. It's these here, and I will hit open. Now by default, Photoshop opens all of your images in the same window, and it, it creates these tabs, which you know some people like it, some people don't. If I zoom out, uh, with my zoom tool, scroll back. I can do that for each one. Um, here's what I like to do. On your top bar, you should see this toolbar here. This one is a really, really good tool for working with multiple images. If I click on that, I can see all these little thumbnails. And you know that would be full screen for all of my images. This next one, it's a grid. It tiles them all. So if I click on that, now I'm, I'm recording this on a I'm recording a small corner of a very large monitor, so use your imagination that these are all getting tiled out here very conveniently. If I go back, I'll hit that consolidate again, bring them back into one, and i got to resize. There we go. So for this next thing, we are going to use uh, a, an automated tool called Photo Merge. Works really good for this kind of stuff. Works good if you want to create panoramics from a bunch of images. But we want to have the layers open. So I'm going to open the layers. This is the layer for this one image that I've got open. I can see a small preview. And uh, let's just keep that there. But the, the, the tool is located underneath, I believe, File and Automate. Now, I've got, you, know, you will not see all this geographic imager stuff. So this is going off the screen. But it's called Photo Merge. At the bottom of this window, you should see something called Photo Merge. Click on that and it opens up this page. So you can either load these files. So actually, I didn't even really need to open all of them. I could have just loaded them directly from here. 
or you can add open files. So either way works. Make sure you've only got the open files that you want to work with. If you're doing a bunch of stuff with, with Photoshop, you'll want to only have the open ones that you want. But I'll go ahead and click that. There are my images. And you've got different options here. You know, just uh, if, if it's a, a bunch of photos from a site, you'd probably want to either do perspective or spherical. The one, the two I pretty much always use are auto and just reposition. Now, because I know these are just repositioned, I will click on that. And uh, you can leave blend images together and hit OK. So at this point, you just let Photoshop do its stuff. Maybe you go get a cup of coffee because it takes a little bit. And it looks like it is done. Let me resize this window. A couple things to notice. The layers, you can see how this stitched together. It used a combination of masks. That's what that black and white thing looks like. And images. So if I turn one of these on and off, I can see that Photoshop has gone in here and stitched those together and tried to try to find as best as it could the, uh, the overlap. So this very conveniently stitched together all of my images. It's higher resolution than if I were to just save it directly from my screen. Unless you're lucky enough to have a very, very large monitor, this is the way to do it. Also worth noticing here is that the file size got very large. I could actually place this in the Illustrator file because it's just a Photoshop. They play well, nice. Uh, they play nice together, but um, not the most efficient way. Uh, it, it, if I want to come back here and edit this, you know, I may want to keep it as a Photoshop, but let's kind of slim this down earlier than later. So what I'll do in my layers, I will right click and I will select Merge Visible. And that takes all those layers, puts them into one. So now I've only got one layer that I can turn on and off. That's a destructive process because now I can never go back. As, as, if I save this and reopen it, I could undo it. But just keep in mind, that is a destructive process. So now I should probably save this. And uh, I will put this in that same folder that I created with the first step, LA232. The other stuff I'm not so concerned about. That's really kind of intermediate work. But let's call this a uh, base map whip. For format, you know, Photoshop is good, JPEG and PNG are a little bit better. Do not use GIF, uh, CompuServe GIF, for this type of thing. I'll go ahead and do, um, where's JPEG? Yeah, JPEG looks good. You'll usually be prompted with additional settings depending on the format. If you're going to, if it's uh, something you're going to be just doing once, you know, maximum or even high, quality will be good. But keep in mind, if I have this set, whenever I open and save it, it recompresses it a little bit each time. So you're going to lose quality. If you're going to open and close it a lot, keep it on maximum quality. You know, for this, we'll keep it at eight. Um, the preview, underneath the preview, it says it should be about one megabyte, which is really nice. It's really a 24.3 megabyte file open, but compressed a very svelte one megabyte. So I'll hit okay. And that should have saved. Let me open my folder to find out. Yep, there it is. So we could scale this. We gotta think about our scale now. This is a, you know, and scale is really a, a representation of real world measurements, typically for paper. You know, for, there's two types of ways to think about scale, your screen resolution scale and your paper resolution. So right now, the only real thing we know about this is its pixel size. I'm going to go to image and image size. Very, very important here. The only thing that ever matters for raster images is your pixel width and your pixel height. Resolution does not matter. Your actual size does not matter because those are related and your resolution doesn't matter. Oh, I already mentioned that. So here's what I mean by that. Because if you say your image is 40 by 30 inches, Okay, what does that mean? It doesn't, you have no idea how big it is until you know the resolution. Same with the resolution. If you say it's 1000 dots per inch, well, that's meaningless unless you know the size. But if you always pay attention to your width in pixels and your height in pixels, that is, uh, that is really the useful information that you will need to know. Now, a lot of geo-based um, imagery that you get from those GIS sites are typically tied to a pixel. A pixel equals a real-world measurement. You'll see 
one pixel equals a foot, you'll see one pixel equals six inches. Sometimes you'll see one pixel equals 60 yards. So that's usually the connecting piece. When it's printed, it's usually a, a measurement unit, inches or centimeters and so on. So just keep that in mind. But you know, the only thing that matters here are pixels. So let's hit okay. Okay, I could resize this. I could resize this resize this to a known measurement right now. So one pixel equals, you know, so many feet. But it, it would be destructive. It would have to resample it. I want to minimize any kind of modifications to this image. So everything else we'll be doing is in Illustrator. That's all we're going to be doing in Photoshop is really photo merging. So you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and close this. Don't save any of those. Let's jump back to Illustrator. And hopefully you've still got this file open like this. All right, on the layers, I will make sure I've got layers, I'm sorry, images selected. And I will go File and Place. In Illustrator, you place things. You don't insert them, you don't import them, you place them. You can either do this or you could drag it and drop it. So let's navigate to that. And there it is. Let me zoom out. Okay, so got our image, we've got our map. We need to figure out what the scale is. We need to find an appropriate scale to get this to fit on our piece of paper. How do we do that? Well, you need to know real world measurement of something that you can measure in our digital paper space. So really, it's, uh, it's whatever you wanna measure. The larger the item you can measure, the better. A lot of people will measure a parking space, you know, because a parking space is usually nine feet wide. You want to be careful about that because not everyone draws their parking spaces exactly like they should be. Sporting fields are usually a bit safer bet. If you have a football field, you know, it's pretty safe that you can measure in zone to end zone and you'll have 100 yards. But I like to find two pieces that you can measure in Google Earth that we can come back here and make a comparison. So when you're doing that, much better to find points that are at the ground level. Don't use the tops of buildings because there's always a little bit of distortion how the photograph was manipulated to be uh, used in the delivery vehicle, whether it's Google Earth or Google Maps. Uh, but if it's, if it's something on the ground, it's a little bit safer bet. So we'll just leave this here for the moment. We've got our artboard, we've got our imported image. We need to find a scale. To do that, I'm going to go back to Google Earth. So Google Earth has a really nifty tool up here that looks like a ruler. If you click on it, you'll see this dialog. And uh, it does what you might expect. Click on it, um, set this to feet, and you can still zoom in and out with your scroll wheel. For this, I would recommend using your arrow keys. I'm tapping my up arrow key to move around, you know, left and right, because if you click in here, it, it does something goopy like that. So let's hit... Uh, Let's double click, hit clear. Maybe hit R again, just so you, you reorient your view so you're looking straight down. And I want to measure from this end to the other end. I just want to know what its real world measurement is. So I will click and release, use my arrow keys to kind of go down here. And I could click again, but this rubber band, so I can just keep an eye on those numbers there. And I can see that it is about, you know, 220, We'll say 220.2. You can get as accurate as you want. So I'll say 220.2. That is, make sure you close this too. That is a pretty reasonable real world measurement from here to here, 220.2. All right, back to here. How do we measure what this is? Well, we can kind of eye it. We know that is 22 inches because that's how big we made our artboard. And so it's about 22 inches. We need to be a little bit closer, but that's kind of good to know because if that's about 22 inches, we're pretty close to one inch equals 10 feet. So you may not know right off the top of your head what is the best scale to represent this at. But you know, you know, know, some simple deduction can tell us one to 10 is gonna be in the ballpark. So what I'm going to do is zoom in on this top area using the zoom tool, maybe get kind of close. And the measure tool for Illustrator, now it looks like one right there. You probably don't have that one. The other measure tool hides underneath the eyedropper tool. So if I click and drag, there it is. I'll tear this one off as well. Now, if you're on a Mac, you can uh, go to help and just do a search. Windows, I think, is the same. Oh, maybe not. Usually, it works pretty good. But 
we found it right here. So this works a little bit different than Google Earth. You you can't you know click and release and then click and release like you could before. You can click and drag. So if I measure from here to here, oh and notice I'm still snapping. Let's turn that off. Window snap to grid is off. All right. So if I do that again, I can click. I'm holding the mouse button and I release, and I can see my distance is one. 0.9 inches. That doesn't really work because it won't scroll down. If I hit my boundary of my window, I'd like that to scroll, but it doesn't. So um, you have to do this a slightly different way. You can either click and drag, or you can click, release, click. And that's what I'll do. So I've got my tool selected. I'll get pretty close to the center of that. Click once. I'll grab my scroll bar on the right and just move down to the other side. And I will click here. Keep an eye over here, watch what happens. Click, there we go, 13.75 inches. So, let's zoom back out. So 13.75 inches uh, is my paper measurement and 220.2, I'm gonna need to write this down so I will forget. So you can use some uh, pretty simple math. I like to use Google as a calendar. If I say 13.75 divided by 220.2, I did that backwards, 220.2 divided by 13.75. There we go. So right now I am at one inch equals 16 feet, which you, it's good to know, but you don't want to, it's very unconventional to use a non-standard, non-whole number for your scale. So let's go back to here. What does that mean? If I draw a square, I'm going to click on my square again. I'll just kind of arbitrarily draw a square up here. I can readjust that to be an exact size. So I'll change that to one inch. This will constrain the value between these two. So make sure that is unchecked and one inch, hit tab. So there I've got a one inch square. This square represents 16 point whatever uh, 16.01 feet, as I just determined from here, which makes sense. That parking lot's probably about, it's a little bit shallow. It's probably okay. Car's probably about 16 feet. So we need, uh, if we want to scale this up to one inch equals 10 feet, that's what I'd recommend. Get your image to something you know. It might not be the exactly correct scale, but as long as it's something that's a little bit easier to work with, uh, you will save yourself some headache. We need to scale this, so rather than from that point to that point being 16 inches, that point to this point on my square is 10 feet. So just by looking at this, you know that the image needs to get larger. You need to divide 10 by something, either this by 10 or 10 by this. Uh, for some reason, I can never quite keep it straight in my head, but if I, if I look at it like this, I know I need a larger number, which means we would divide that by 10. So here, let's do this. Well, actually, we don't need to do that because that's pretty simple, 1.601, or, 160.1%. Hope that makes sense. If not, rewind and uh, re-listen. So if I scale this image up 160.01%, it will be exactly one inch equals 10 feet. Here's how you do that. Grab your select tool. Uh, okay, actually don't do it this way. Here's one way you can do it, but uh, probably don't want to do it this way. If you grab this corner, you can distort it. You do not want to do that. If you grab this corner and you hold on shift, you can constrain the proportions, but uh, you can't. You can kind of eye it. It's going to be really tough to get close. Here's a more detailed way to scale this. It's selected. Go to Object, Transform, and Scale. Get a very convenient dialog here, and I want to scale that to 160.01. Hit OK. There we go. Now this image should be exactly one inch equals 10 feet. And we can verify that by zooming in. I'll grab my measure tool again. Click and release. Scroll down, click and release. And I can see my measurement is 200, I'm sorry, 22.03 inches. If one inch equals 10 feet, going off of what I learned in Google Earth, that is spot on.
So let's zoom out a little bit more. All right, so now I can see that that's actually a lot bigger than what I thought. So maybe one inch equals 20 feet would make a little bit more sense. How do we get to that? Well, we just need to cut this in half because we need to represent twice as much actual world measurements in that same one inch square. So it's still selected, object, transform, and uh, we'll do scale. It just keeps the same value you previously had, but this is um, this has nothing to do with its current size. So I'll just type 50, and it will create 50% of that. What is that now? Hit OK. So now we are at 1 inch equals 20 feet. That's pretty good. I think I can make that work, because all I'm really concerned about is this block. So if I drag this to my page, notice uh, I'm on top of my grid, but I'm below my guides that I created. So that's why I created that guide. I can get rid of this little square over here. Don't need him anymore. So we could just position this and have it overlap. When this gets exported as a PDF, anything that is outside of the boundary of our artboard gets cropped. So what we have here is effectively called a bleed. Our image bleeds to the edge. If we were to print this and you wanted a true bleed, you'd go even beyond uh, that a little bit because of how it gets printed and cut, but we don't want to do that. We want to mask this or crop it. So here's kind of the uh, the really chintzy way to do it. You can set your stroke to nothing by clicking that and change your foreground color to white and start drawing boxes. I'm just kind of hiding it. Don't do that way. That's one way you can do it, but there are better ways to do it. So delete, 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 delete. What we want to do is create a mask, or a clipping mask. And uh, I'll show you a couple ways. But, uh, you know, we'll jump straight to the fun stuff. If I create my shapes, you know, I'll do a star shape, draw a star, doesn't matter what my foreground or fill is. On top of that, grab my select tool. Now, I'm going to hold on shift and click on the image. Shift is really the universal add to selection modifier. So every program you work with, We'll probably use shift as an add to. So now I've got two things selected, my base map and that shape. And I think I want to go to object, clipping mask, and make. Or I could just do the shortcut here. So there we go. Maybe a nice store, a star border that masked my image. Now I can move that around just like it's a standalone object. I'm doing undo here to get back. If you want to edit this, here's another really important convention you'll see around most applications. We've got really a nested element. Some people call it components, some people call it um, symbols, uh, applications, I, I mean, call it that. To edit this, you want to double click. And watch what happens in the upper right hand corner. If I double click, I can see that I'm inside of that nested element and I can see a group. And usually these are nested pretty deep. So if I double click on the image, now I'm changing the image. And if I were to move the image and then hit escape a bunch of times, I've moved the image relative to its mask. So let's undo that a bunch of times just to get back to here. That's one way to do it. You know, maybe a circle would make more sense than a, uh, than a star. So I'm just repeating it, clipping mask make. There we go, now it's in a circle. Undo it and I'll get rid of that. That's just one way to create a really quick clipping mask. There's another way that I'll show you uh, that I like to use. And uh, to, before I jump into that, I want to get this kind of close. So I'm looking at my guide. I maybe want to include a little bit of the street all the way around. Uh, I can see my text down here. So that looks pretty good. So now what I'll do is I will create a mask by using this button right here, conveniently called mask. All right, review time. Let's click, click in white space so nothing is selected. If I click on this image and I drag that handle, it distorts it. You do not want to do that. If I drag this, it also distorts it. Again, you can hold on shift to constrain that, but again, distorts it. Once it's at the scale, you don't really want to mess with it. If I highlight that image and click on the mask button here, now before you do anything else, grab one of those handles and drag and release and watch what happens. It's masking it. Okay, I need to turn my snaps back on because I could get close, but not quite close enough. So let's do this. Let's go to view, um, snap to grid. I don't know if that's the same thing as snapping. Well, actually grid guide, it's the same thing. So that will work. 
Actually, I think the, the grid and the um, the guides. Oh, yeah, if we go to guides, I thought you could snap to guides in here. Anyway, it's working because it's snapping to the grid. That's good enough. Clicking and dragging. Clicking and dragging. Whoops, I didn't. I was not being careful of what I was grabbing, so let's go back to here. There. Oh, now I really messed it up. As soon, that's why you really want to be careful when you start adjusting your mask because if you click on something else, these handles return to their normal distort functionality. But if that happens, that's okay. You, you know, your 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 first instinct might be to find that mask button again, but you've already started it, so it's not there. So what you need to do is double click on that element because just like before, we've got another masked component. Now, if I click once, I can kind of see that boundary, so I can tell that I've got my image selected. Notice I can move it independent of that mask. That's kind of nifty. If I click on the edge right here, watch those handles kind of change. Now I'm once again adjusting the mask. So good stuff to know. Let's uh, right click. That side's not looking quite like I want it to. Double click. the edge and I don't know why that's not snapping quite to the edge. Let's turn off smart guides. Maybe that's doing it. I'll turn off snap to grid. I'll just eye it. Alright, for some reason it's being a little weird on me, but alright, that looks good. We know what our scale is, we know where the location is. Be very wary of what's happening up here because that's telling you you're still editing uh, an, an element. So I like to grab the select tool and just click kind of in white space a few times until there's nothing. Let's fix the rest of this. There's just a few more um, few more things we need to, to do to make this a good map. The site name, I'll grab the text tool, double or triple click in here. Yeah, it's going to be getting a little bit close to the edge, so I'll change that manually down to 65. City and state. Okay, the longitude and latitude. How do we know what that is? Well, let's go back to Google Earth. I meant to mention this earlier, but I forgot. So on Google Earth, you can either turn on your status bar, and it'll show you the long and lat in the center of your page, or actually where your cursor is at, so notice that's moving around. But uh, if you want to copy and paste it, put, put a place mark. That's this little thing here. Just you know, dump a place mark. It's going to be close enough. And there's our longitude and latitude right over here. So I'll go ahead and do my longitude first. Copy. Paste. Let's go back here. Latitude. Copy. And position my cursor. Paste. Now keep in mind these are four separate elements, so they might get messed up. Uh, let's undo, bring those back. I find it a little bit easier to do that because if I only want to scale the title, I can just do that really quickly rather than having to go in there and edit that first line of a block of text. Let's move that up a little bit. So all right, that's looking pretty good. Let's close this because I just used that to get my longitude and latitude. It's always a good idea to include a written and graphic scale. We know this is 1 inch equals 20 feet. How do we do a graphic scale? Well, a very conventional way is to do these little little rectangles. And I will use my rectangle tool. I'll just arbitrarily draw a rectangle. Because up here, I can manually make that 1 inch wide by, oh, let's say 0.2 inches high. So that gives me that one right there. Um, I'm going to turn on this thing called Smart Guides. Yours may or may not be on. That's when you're seeing those, those lines kind of popping up as you're moving stuff around. That's what Smart Guides means. It's essentially a smart snapping feature. If I turn that on, and I'll zoom in a little bit closer to this. Now, also very important that you have your snaps turned off, because that will, that will mess this part up here. I will select this, and I'll hold down the Option key on a Mac, you'll want to use Alt on a PC. Before I click and drag, that creates a copy. So now as I click and drag, I'm creating a copy. As soon as I let go, it places it. So I'm looking for that intersect. It's green, so I hope you can see it. 
There we go. Now I'll let go of my keyboard and my mouse and repeat the process. Hold down Option, click and drag, and let go. So there we've got a very, just a very minimalist, conventional graphic scale. If this were to get printed or someone were just to find this line around and uh, they measured that, if it was one inch, you're pretty safe to assume that the scale is correct. Now let's put this down here. Now, why did I make this 22 by 34 inches? It's very conveniently twice the size of 11 by 17. So this was half, if this was printed on 11 by 17, our scale would no longer be correct, but someone could connect those dots pretty quickly. The one other thing I have, or a couple other things, but one thing I had in my example was the little north arrow. So this next part, I'm going to fly through pretty quickly, but um, just use the pause and uh, replay button a lot. For this, we will be using what's called a Pathfinder tool. Pathfinder is what Illustrator refers to, or what it calls Boolean operation. A Boolean operation are typical things like add, subtract, union, divide. So if you have two shapes, um, you can either combine them, you can split the difference, you can only show the common area. They're called different things in different applications, but you know, mathematically they are Boolean operations. Illustrator calls them Pathfinder. So we want our Pathfinder dialog open. And uh, I'm going to draw a circle. Holding down shift will let me draw a perfect circle so it's not an egg or an oval. Let's get rid of that. And I'm going to draw a square up here. Now, if you, if you have your select tool chosen and you kind of just hover over the edges, you'll see your icon change. So even though there is a rotate tool, um, you don't need to grab the rotate tool to rotate this. You can grab your select tool, hover over the edge until you see the icon change, and then click and drag. So I'm holding the mouse button, I'm dragging. If you hold on shift, shift is really the magic kind of modifier key. When in doubt, hold down shift, see what happens. But look what it's doing. It is snapping that to a 45 degree angle. And I will let go of my mouse when that's at 45 degrees. Why did I do that? Because I'm going to make a copy to make a little chevron shape here. I will select both of those. Oops, I accidentally selected my text there, so you gotta be careful. Try it this way. Click, holding down shift, click. And I will use this tool right here, the intersect option. Whoops, wrong one. Let's try this one, the minus front. There we go, that's the shape I wanted. Now I'll click down here. I'm using that smart guide to get that to snap to the center. You know, that looks good. Select those both. This time I will do, oh, let's try subtract or minus front again. Yep, there we go. So now I've got a nice little shape that I can use for my north arrow. And I will click, make an N, double click. Let's make that white. You know what, I'm gonna do that again because I did it really quick. I've got my text selected. If I double click on my foreground color, you will see this, your color picker. You can just drag around to find the color or you can just type it in manually if you happen to know it. So there's my text. Now I'm going to convert that to a graphic. Right now it's an editable piece of text, but since it's really simple, I'm going to right click and say, create outlines. You know what, I gotta zoom up so you can see that. Right click, create outlines. It converts that letter to a shape. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, um, printing, sometimes it helps if the if your printer doesn't understand the font language, your fonts don't end up goofy. But sometimes like this too, you may just want to do another Boolean operation. So I'm going to select that, hold on shift, select that. Let's see if this works this time. Um, filter presents. We might need to ungroup this one. So right click on our kind of arrow circle, ungroup. There we go, so now that piece is separate. Hold on shift, hold on shift, click. Wrong button again. There we go. So now it punched that out. Why do we do that? Oh, because I'm kind of uh, picky about graphics. And now this was to go over here, you can see through it. So that's kind of neat. Right? All right. 
So now if I wanted to regroup those, I can shift, select, right click, and group. And now I can scale that down. All right, it's looking pretty good. Uh, the one thing we need to do, seems minor, but it's actually really important. We need to properly cite or attribute this image. Google is really good about making this stuff you know, freely available to use, but you don't want to abuse that. Back in Blackboard, one of the other links I've gotten here is Google Imagery Permissions. Uh, if we click on that, you get a little kind of questionnaire. It's like, hey, what are you using this for? Just, you know, if you follow that, it uh, will say, yeah, it's okay to use it for education. Just make sure you properly provide attribution. And the attribution, as I mentioned before, is that little Google in the corner. Normally it's always there if you save an image from Google Earth, but because we kind of did that little workaround, we lost it. So, you know, that's where I like to just keep a, a little graphic, you know, good karma. Um, but I'll keep a little graphic of Google Earth that looks like this that I can just drop into place. So I've got that image once again. You know, this time I will drag it and drop it. Let's see, there it is. Before I went to image place, this one, if I just drag it and drop it, it just dumps it right in there. So it's not quite, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of just like a little white block down there. We will change the appearance of this to what's called multiply, which will make whites and lights transparent. To access that, you want to go to Window and Appearance. And you should see a dialog that looks like this. With that selected, there's an opacity. Click that, and on this drop down list, hit Multiply. Close that. Now I can zoom in and kind of put that into place. So there we go. We've got our, our citation, our attribution. Uh, everything else is correct. If we were to print this, the scale would be correct. Keep in mind the grid does not print, um, and uh, we'd be pretty much ready to go. So let's uh, let's save this. You know, I, I'll talk briefly since I've actually got two images linked in here. Now the base image I placed in the folder. So if I move that folder around, it will always be with this file when I open up this Illustrator file. If I uh, did that, I would lose the Google image because that is not in the folder. So you may or may not want to embed these. If you go to your links dialog, so window links, you'll see this. And you can see just that, everything you've, you've placed in here. If you highlight it and hit that flyout button, you should have an option here to embed. It makes your actual Illustrator file larger. Uh, for little things, it's okay. For big things, I tend to rely more on just um, efficient file management on the directory side. But this is where you embed things when you do it that way. So, almost done. We need to export this as a PDF. So, I can go to export, but you're not going to find PDF in there. That's if you wanted to export this as an image. You can go to AutoCAD. That's kind of cool. JPEG. Let's hit cancel. The PDF feature is actually under the Save As dialog. So Illustrator, Save As, and you can save it as another Illustrator file, but you can also do PDF. The reason for that is they're both Adobe products. PDF is really the, uh, the accepted portable document format, which is why it's called PDF, but um, it's kind of neat because you can create a PDF that retains its ability to be edited in Illustrator, which means it keeps that layer structure and all that good stuff. But we just want a bare bones, non-illustrator PDF. So with PDF selected, hit save, you'll see another dialog. And this has a drop down with a few different options. If it's something you just want it as small as possible, you would do that. If you absolutely want to print it, you would probably do press or high quality print. We'll do high quality print. That should keep it small enough. And here, let's deselect preserve illustrator That'll make it a little bit smaller, but again, it's just a, a good PDF to use. So hit Save PDF. Uh, you might get warned saying, hey, you're going to lose your ability to edit in Illustrator. I was not really paying attention to my name. I probably should have been, but there it is right there. So here I can see, too, file management. My Illustrator one is 21 megabytes. That PDF is 1.5. If I open that, there we go. Ready to be plotted. 
and uh, ready to bust out the tracing paper to start doing some analysis and programmatic drawing. So before I finish, I'd like to go back to my list of links in Blackboard just to quickly review why I included these and why you might want to visit them. Google Imagery, imagery Permissions. Poke around there to um, uh, just make sure that you're using your imagery correctly when you do. The Google Earth slash Geo Model Tutorials. Come here if you're not really used to navigating Google Earth. Just hit up some of the beginner tutorials, especially these two, navigation and, uh, and searching for places and drawing and measuring. That kind of helped you get around. And while you are here, I would look at these links. We'll be definitely doing this stuff very soon, and it's definitely related to the major project for this class, as we'll be submitting an entry to the Model Your Town competition. So that's that link. The uh, next two we talked about, these other two are just getting started with Illustrator, getting started with Photoshop. Now, minimally, I'd like you to be able to follow along with me. I don't want to spend a lot of time on the real basic stuff in Illustrator and Photoshop. So come here, watch some of these introductory tutorials. I'll go over some very basic navigating in class, but that stuff will serve you well to go over that. All right, so if you can do this um, with your own site, that you'll be selecting based off of the studio project, you are in business. And with that, I will, in the video, let me know if you have any questions.